All right, recording has started. So as I said, uh, I can already see Q&A is filling up, so I, I won't uh, take up too much time with my own question because I want to make sure everyone has time for theirs. But first, I just wanted to ask you, Jim, so you've been writing fiction now for more than two decades. Could you tell us the, uh, the story of how your first Dresden Files book got published? Oh, uh, that was a, it was a class project in college. Uh, I was in a class called Writing a Genre Fiction Novel. And it was being taught by a, Debra, a woman named Deborah Chester, who I was not listening to very much because she was just a journalism professor teaching professional writing. You know, I had, uh, I had a degree in English literature <laughs> with an emphasis in creative writing, whereas she had merely published 35 novels. So, you know, I, mean, I, I knew better than her, let's face it. <laughs> Uh, so one semester, I had taken her class several semesters, and one semester I decided uh, that I was going to listen to the advice that she's, she'd given me, and I was, gonna, I was going to listen to her in order to prove her wrong. So I was going to do absolutely everything she was telling me to do. I was going to fill out all her little charts and do her little worksheets and her outlines, and then she would see what terrible cookie-cutter pablum crap emerged from that kind of uh, creative process. And I wrote the first book of the Dresden Files, you know, which showed her, so... Uh, we're on books, I don't know, like 17 now, I think, if you include the, the short story anthologies. And uh, uh, I'm sure any day she's going to call me and acknowledge that I was right. You know, <laughs> any moment now, it's going to happen. All right, cool. And so let's see, I see the questions are piling up here. So we'll get to the audience questions very soon. Also, I see a lot of stuff in the chat. You're welcome to use the chat, but if you have questions, please use the Q&A because it's much easier for us to keep track. So um, I do want to ask you a bit about your writing process here before I open it up for the audience. Um, sure. Could you tell us a bit about your writing process and how has that evolved for you over time? I know um, most writers say they kind of fall into two camps, either they're, uh, they're the plotters or the pantsers. They, you know, they plot everything out in outlines or they write by the seat of their pants. Do you, which of those camps would you fall into? Uh, you can't avoid doing them both while you're writing a book, so. I see it as a meaning, as a distinction without a difference. <laughs> uh, uh, no matter how tightly you plot something, you always come up with something better along the way and you've got to adjust for it. And um, uh, uh, no matter uh, uh, how dedicated you are to writing things by the seat of your pants, if you write a decent story, it has one sort of general look, at least in Western storytelling. Uh, um, you know, the, 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 most stories are the same story. You know, I think there's only six or seven different ones. And I think of those two of them kind of suck. Uh, uh, so <laughs> that leaves you with about five stories that you can, you can do. And really only one or two of them really get used a lot. So. Okay, cool. Well, I will just go ahead and get started on these audience questions here. And I'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, let me open up the proper window here. All right. Um, so how this is question is from Dean. Um, how does Jim keep track of all the small details of his universe? Notes, flow charts, what do you use? Uh, I reread the series often. Uh, and uh, I have a, a group of beta readers who, who help me out. Um, there are several people in the, in the crew who are there specifically because they are really good with details. And, you know, they'll say, oh, no, no, you said in chapter, you said in chapter four of you know book book 13 that this character's eyes were sea green but in chapter 11 of book four you said they were they you said they were sea blue so which is it? it's like oh okay all right i got you but you know there's the sort that's the sort of detail that 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 you know that they they that readers i think are better at keeping up with than writers because you guys do it for fun and i do it as a job so you know no matter no matter how much i enjoy my work I'm not going to enjoy it as much as you enjoy your fun, uh, uh, which I think gives the readers an advantage in, in, in certain ways over, over writers, so. Cool, thank you. Okay, let's see, we have a question here from Kena asking, will we ever get an in-depth backstory of Bob the Skull at some point, especially when he was evil Bob? Oh, well, his evil Bob story isn't terribly exciting. You know, I mean, he was a minor, he was a minor villain who sat around cackling, doing evil things for a while. Uh, uh, it was basically just a lackey, so he wasn't too much fun. Um, as far as Bob's whole story goes, I don't know if we'll ever get it in the books. Um, uh, uh, Bob started off as the skull of the hapless best friend of Merlin. Uh, 
a, a guy named Eddie Yen who very good at wizarding, but he was a fair-handed enchantment, and, and he he's the guy who made Bob the Skull. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean that was where Bob that was where Bob got started, uh, and has just kind of passed along through several wizards uh, along the line. Um, I don't know how much more detail we'll get into we'll, we'll get into than that. Um, uh, I know they, they had a whole history written up for him for the television show, but it wasn't the same Bob. So it was kind of, you know, it's sort of a different set situation. But, uh, you know, for the television show, they, they came up with a whole, you know, a whole story for his whole life and everything. And it was impressive. And I don't think we ever got to see very much of it. So <laughs> that's, that's too bad. And so I was actually going to ask you about the, the TV series. How, how, what was that experience like? Did you get, were you kind of consulted a lot on it or what, did you basically just give them the source material and let them do what they were going to do? Oh, um, I was not even comped a copy of the DVDs. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. I, I made about half of what I make on one book uh, at that time. I made about half of what I make on one book at that time and uh, to get paid for it. Uh, and, and they didn't even copy me a copy of the DVD. So uh, as it turned out, I got along with the guy who was on set running the show. Uh, uh, that was Robert Wolf, who, who did so much work for DS9 and, and was uh, he was really working hard to make a good Dresden Files product. And, and a couple of weeks before shooting started, they, they kind of pulled the rug out from under him. So, you know, he was working uphill, you know, up till then there was a plan to have the Dresden Files as a serial. And we were going to do the events of the first two books as season one and kind of have a big old, you know, a big old conflicty explosive climax of both books at the same time, which would have been cool. Hmm. Um, but then about two weeks before they started shooting, they got a call from California and said, oh, yeah, we put somebody else in charge and we're not going to do a serial anymore. We're going to do a series. And they're like, we don't have time to rewrite. We start shooting in two weeks. They're just like, ah, just change the characters' names and, you know, change the order of all the, of all the, of all the episodes. It'll be fine. It's like, oh, no, no, it won't be fine. That's all right. That's all right. right. They still did a fairly good job with what they had. So. Oh, good. Okay. All right, let's see. And so I'll just go ahead and answer this question. Someone asked, is it, okay? is it possible to get books signed uh, without being at an event? At least for this event, there will be no book signings. I can't speak for Jim as far as uh, whether you give out signed books, but there's nothing like that involved with this event. <laughs> um, so. uh, there's an address on my, uh, on my website. Um, you, can, you can write that and, try and get something set up. Um, if you're willing to pay postage, I'm generally willing to sign if you don't go crazy with, you know, uh, uh, your, 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 the, your, your collections that you're selling. I, I don't normally like to sign those quite as much as I do, you know, fans books, but. Thank you. Uh, let's see, a question here from Ryan. Um, are there any deities that you won't have Harry go against? Oh. I mean, offhand, I can't think of any. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's Dresden. He'll lip off to anybody who needs lipping off to. And if that person happens to be a deity, that just means there'll be a, a price for it, you know. <laughs> but he'll still he'll still lip off and that'll cause the conflict. So, And so, you know, Harry has been such a beloved character for so many of your readers now for decades. Uh, I'm curious, what, what was the inspiration for Harry as a character? Are you drawing from any particular people or characters? Oh, uh Harry, I Frankenstein together um, uh, because I put him together very artificially for the series because that was what my teacher suggested. Uh, so uh, essentially, I just I just took a bunch of my favorite wizards in private eyes and took an axe to them and took the parts that I liked and kept, and, uh, uh, and the parts I didn't like I threw away and and sort of glommed them all together into one you know fusion of Merlin and Sherlock and Spencer and you know. Uh, Belgarath and several other, you know, wizard and private eye type char- characters and got Harry Dresden and uh, just kind of give, gave him the standard issue smart mouth, uh, um, which, you know, come to think of it, it probably explained a lot of my difficulties growing up. <laughs> <laughs> it may be that I may, I, I just may have been the, the person who would lip off to anyone. So uh, <laughs> it could be uh, some of my problems in life, but uh, uh, I seem to have mostly shifted that onto Dresden now. So. You know, he can he can be the one who lips off and gets in trouble. Uh, okay, there you go. Uh, let's see. So kind of related to the character of Harry, we have another question here asking. Um, there's a lot of imagery of the frontiersman or sheriff of sheriffs of the old west attached to Harry Dresden. Is the Western hero one which particularly appeals to you? 
Well, I would say the Western hero is one which appeals to anybody who studies the craft of storytelling because it just fits in so well. Um, just your standard, your standard Western gunfight the bad guy at high noon plot, you know, is, is, is a good core basic story. And uh, uh, being able to work with those characters, you know, it, it lets you do so many things because so much of your story is already done for you. You don't have to think about it too much. So you get to work on the grace notes. Uh, uh, so when you're when you're working with um, with archetypes like that, that I mean, that's the whole reason to do that. One is because, you know, you love the story and you love what you're doing with the characters. But the other is so that when you're using something that is a, a very typical character, the hard boiled private eye, you know, the, the investigative uh, wizard character, um, you, 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 the audience and you both kind of have an idea of the sort of things they're going to be doing. Uh, and you can, and so you don't have to think about that part too hard. You can think about, okay, let me make the world more real. Let me make the other characters more real. Let me make uh, the situations more dire, the moral quandaries more impossible, you know, uh, which is the whole reason to use archetypes is so that, you know, you can, you, you know, it's essentially like a, 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 like a carpenter working at his tool bench, you know, I mean, he, he doesn't sit down and think to himself, okay, I'm building this cabinet. So I'm going to need a T square and a pencil, and I'm going to need this saw and this, this particular wood. His hands just go to the place where he needs them to go and he picks up the stuff that he needs to make the cabinet because he's very familiar with all these elements and all these tools and it's the same way for storytelling um you know once you've become you know familiar with an element you can use it without thinking about it too much and as a result you don't have to spend quite so much processing time on okay here's how the abc of the story works you already know how that works so you spend you know you spend your processing time on okay let's make sure this we we get to this scene more smoothly let's make sure we make this you know, this poignant moment, more heartrending, you know, so you can spend your energy in better spots. Cool. Uh, let's see. We have a question here that I was going to ask you as well is uh, how many books do you anticipate the uh, Cinder Spires to, to have? Uh, I set up the Cinder Spires to be three or six, depending on, on how well they were received. Um, uh, uh, so it's, we're, it's looking like we, we could go towards this, towards this, Six -ish, six ish now at this point i think but uh uh we'll, we'll see how the next book is received as soon as i've done writing it I, I've, I've been working on that one and and uh i was i was kind of getting set to set it aside and try something else but then a bunch of a bunch of cinder spires fans came up to me at dragon con and so now it's just like oh i can't just leave these guys hanging now i've already started the story i've, I've got to get something done for them so it looks like that's what i'll be doing next well, I, I, I keep seeing a bunch of comments coming. Everyone's saying six, six, yes, goes for six. So <laughs> you've, you've certainly got fans who would like to read six books of that. Um, let's see. So what's some other good questions here? Um, will we ever see another fantasy series from you? Um, and I'm also curious, do you ever have any desire to kind of revisit that world of the Codex Alera? Uh, I don't know if I'll go back to Alera. Uh, I, I could, there's a couple of spots I could go back. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Um, but I, I think the next the next fantasy series I'll work on is probably my epic, epic fantasy epic. <laughs> you know, because I mean, every writer who writes fantasy has to write an epic, epic, epic fantasy epic. I mean, that's just how it works. Um, so I've I've got I've got a good idea for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, sort of Lord of the Rings meets Incredibles. <laughs> we'll we'll see what that, we'll see how that goes. Ah, right, cool, cool. That's exciting. Um, so I saw someone else comment and saying congratulations to your son for the um, publication of his first book. Um, yeah. How cool is that experience? Yeah, that's, uh, that's cool. It's a lot of what I've been working on lately. A lot of my professional energy is, has, <laughs> has gone into, you know, him and helping him out. Um, but hopefully we'll have twice as many, you know, Jim Butcher's producing things now. So, you know, hopefully that'll work out well for everyone. Oh, cool. The kid's good. He's better. I mean... Maybe because he's got a parent who's teaching him, but you know, can spend more time with him. But he's better than me. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, what else do we have here? So, how do you deal with the pressure of your fans who want books as fast as possible to continue the story versus how much natural time it takes for you to write these books, plus living a regular life? Um, well, I, I don't get to live a regular life as much. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to deal with some things that, that, that uh, a lot of people don't have to, you know, I, I have some issues with, with stalking and stuff like that. Uh, but that's just sort of standard issue stuff for, you know, low level celebrities, which is kind of what I am. Um, and, uh, uh, but generally speaking, you know, 
I, I just, I got to get work done. So I, I go do it. Um, and that's, you're really at the end of the day, you know, I've got to, I've got to keep paying my bills and, and, uh, uh, you know, pay for my house like everybody else. So. Okay. Chris in the audience says, tell us to cool our jets. We can wait. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. So question here from Scott saying, um, does Stormfront contain any clues as to who the big bad villain of the series is? Uh, I don't know if there is a big bad villain. Um, I mean, there's a lot of villains, you know, I don't know a villain. Uh, I, sp I, sp I, I suppose that, I suppose that, you know, I suppose the sleeper might be, but, you know, he's, he's so big, he's almost an environment rather than a villain. I don't know if I would think of it the same way. It's really hard to answer questions like this because as, as a writer who works with story elements and stuff all the time, I have a very different viewpoint on all of it, I think, than, than most people who are reading the story. Um, so occasionally it's, it's, it's sort of difficult to, to, to you know, because our, our, the, the terms that the, that the readers are using are, don't necessarily line up to the definitions that they have in their head and I have in my head. You know, yeah. Not necessarily the same. Uh, uh, that, that occasionally makes questions like that difficult to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> understandable. Uh, let's see. So question here asking, um, the Harry Dresden stories are unusual in that over time, the protagonist bonds with many characters who he later calls on for help. One other fictional character with that trait is Peter Gunn. I've often wondered whether you borrowed that idea from old Blake Edwards TV series. I did not. I borrowed it from, uh, uh, from Robert Parker's Spencer, uh, uh, Private Eye. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read the Spencer books, but the Spencer universe is a universe of, 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 of tough guys with their own unique moral codes, you know, it's essentially the way that universe works. And, and I just love, you know, that the villain in one story may be the hero or, you know, maybe the sidekick in the next one or vice versa, uh, uh, which makes it, you know, really interesting because Spencer's a character who has to deal with all these very interesting people uh, uh you know he has to deal with them in terms of blood and life and death a lot of the times uh, uh but the the dynamic of those characters and the way that they get along with each other is something that i just always adored i mean spencer does frenemies better than anyone and uh <laughs> i just love that and so i loved using it for the dresden files oh cool yeah i was gonna ask for the the kind of pi element who you were drawing your inspiration from i thought Large, largely spent robert parker's my professional hero Oh, cool. I thought maybe there was a little bit of a Philip Marlowe kind of influence in there as well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I've been Gashel Hammett's been is, you know, is in my is in my background as well. But Robert Parker is, is you know, he's sort of the the modern he was the modern American writer and uh, uh, was somebody I, I I felt a certain amount of kinship, professional kinship to, although I never got to meet him. I, I, I'm disappointed by that. But, but you know, he didn't start writing until he was 45 and then he became one of the most prolific writers in America. And then he died in his eighties at the keyboard, like a man. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's how I want to go out. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was other ways, but I thought they, they might be more impolite to the person who would have to be there with me. So, you know, keyboard, that's fine now. Yeah. That's pretty legendary. That's yeah. Something yeah. I <laughs> uh, let's see a uh, question. This is from Dustin. A question everyone wants to know, how is Fenris? How is Fenris? All right, all right. proof of life, Fenris. <laughs> there he is. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's curled up on, on, on my blanket. All right, we love to see that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cat lover, cat owner myself, so that's what always makes me happy. <laughs> um, my blanket, it's either my blanket or the dog's bed that he's always sleeping on. So, you know, he comes and kicks, kicks one of us off. You know, he's the boss. The rest of us are just like, oh, no. We, we get along as best we can. Oh, good. I see. I see another furry friend in the background there. That's good. It's good that's that's my, pit bull, my pit bull, Brutus. And so they, they get along? Oh, yeah, they get along. They get along good. Fenris is the boss. Uh, he's the brains. Brutus is the muscle, you know. <laughs> All right, let's see. If I want to try to get to as many of these questions as I can here. Let's see. Um, another one here asking, uh, as the leading writer of the urban fantasy literature genre, um, to what degree do you think urbanity needs to be included in the genre? None at all. Cities aren't necessary at all. Um, all that, that me and the other urban fantasy people are doing, all we're doing is we are reiterate, reiterating uh, Grimm's fairy tales. 
uh, except that instead of the dark, instead of the dark jungle of the forest, we have the concrete jungle instead, and that's really the only difference. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I mean, honestly, that's that's all all we're doing. We're playing with the same elements. We're using the same stories. We have the same kind of victims and solutions. And and you know, honestly, we we just take the stuff that other people you know who came before us who you know thought of good stuff. You know, they came up with good stuff, and it seemed to work for them. So we just use that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, writers is always like, where do you get your ideas? It's like, oh, it's not the ideas. That's easy. It's it's getting the story out. That's hard. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you've certainly influenced a generation of writers now that you've, you've been doing this for so long. Um, oh, it, technically, I guess that's true. Jeez. <laughs> uh, let's see. This, uh, I'm not sure if you can reveal this or not, but someone asked, uh, when Harry spoke to his father in a dream, was his father a ghost or something else? Uh, I'm not going to say. <laughs> There's more I'm not going to say. All right. We'll keep that one close uh, up here. Actually, actually We'll say it was not a ghost. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. A question here from Emily: uh, What is Olympian bronze, the material that is alloyed with mordite to get titanic bronze? Oh, uh, uh, well, it's 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 an ancient element from from back in the day. Uh, there's not a lot of there was never a lot of it around in that, and there's not really any around now. Uh, um, but it's stuff from you know it's stuff from the old world uh, uh, that you know used to be the nukes and the tanks of, the, of their day and uh, uh you know now it's you know it's not quite the same but uh for the for, for the for the sake of ethne though that was you know, it was like the worst thing she could have been wearing so that, that's a that's a take on everybody sort of suit of armor uh definitely a definitely definitely a final boss suit of armor yeah <laughs> um, although she wasn't even a boss she was a she was she was a you know she was a waypoint boss good lord uh, i'm so work ahead of me <laughs> uh, question here from ray uh, saying first i love all three of your series can you talk about what you learned writing epic battles in battleground and what sort of thing you're looking forward to and or dreading with the upcoming epic battles um i think the thing i, I this what i really learned about writing battles uh, you know, at least in battleground is the importance of point of view uh, and being able to to put your character at a point of view that lets you give either the immediate impression of a battle, because the immediate impression of a battle is just sound and motion and threat and adrenaline, and that's all that's happening. And you can't really see. I mean, you can't really see what's going on a few feet beyond you uh, uh, the first time, even if you're doing a simulated battle. The first time you go into that, you can't even see. You, you, you can't even tell what's happening you know, three feet the other side of the person right in front of you. Um, uh, but if you're, you know, but if you're somebody who's standing back and observing, you can see more. And if you're, if you're with the general of the army who's directing everything, you can see more yet. Um, so that's really is, is the hardest part of writing a battle is, is choosing how close to zoom the camera in on the fighting you know, get up close and intense and frantic. And sometimes you want it a little bit further back and dramatic. And sometimes, you know, you want it even further back than that. So you can apply some intellectualism to what's going on and, and, and you know, kind of talk about, you know, the overall situation, but knowing which, which lens to use where is the hard part. Cool. Uh, let's see here. We have a question from Lee asking, Mab has been almost strangely nicer to Harry, at least more respectful. Can you expand on why that is? Um, part of it is because Dresden is behaving in a manner which she deems to be more mature. Um, Mab's, Mab's standards of maturity are not, are not, are not, uh, uh very normative, let's say, <laughs> you know, Mab's standards of maturity are, 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 have much more to do with, you know, how many children you're willing to kill to get the thing to get your job done you know that sort of thing uh, she is very much a columns of numbers sort of person and dresden has been has been in the black with her lately uh, so she treats him better and when he starts doing things that are not nearly as as, as uh, in line with her plans then you know she may well react differently uh, uh, on the other hand you know 
she just engaged him to the queen of the succubi and you know, that's just not a that's not a friendly move that's not a move you that's not something you do to to your friend you know uh, you, you know, hey hey good news you know i just set up a, i just set up a marriage between you and lara ray it's going to be spectacular for a while you know i mean that's what what can you say about that you know Oh, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. We have kind of a, a cheeky question here from Ari saying, I adore the Dresden. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Harry has been my comfort character for years. Do you take pleasure in the emotional turmoil you cause Harry and the readers? I, I take no pleasure in the emotional turmoil, in the emotional turmoil I cause Harry. Oh, but the readers, I, okay, okay. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh let's see a question here from steve um jim you are a noted fan of lois mcmaster bujold i'm sorry if i'm not pronouncing that right um you no, have... oh i did okay uh and you've also uh directly referenced steve brust in dresden files um have you met either of them in person or otherwise directly communicated with them if so what did you talk about i met lois at a convention 15 years ago maybe maybe a little longer than that um and it was just in a green room at a con uh, uh and it wasn't like a, one of the big cons or anything which is a regular size con. and uh oh come on i fed you twice already <laughs> um but and i walked up to her and i told her how much i loved miles and how how much he was the he, he was the science fiction version of bugs bunny that just no matter what happened to him, he'd be popping back up with an idea. You know, you could run him over with a steamroller and he would sort of, you know, sit back up a minute later and be like, but wait, and, and come up with some, something else that would get him into even more trouble. And uh, uh, Miles is, is one of my favorite characters, although I think his mom, his, his, his parents are even stronger characters. They're, they're just excellent. Um, I, I don't know if you all have read uh, uh, the Vorkazigan saga that, that uh, Lois Bujold wrote but it's won more Hugo Awards than, than any other series out there and is just in general, just a, del a delight to read. Lois is one of the few writers that I can read and completely set aside my, my, my analysis of her style and of, of you know, what she's doing with her plot and how she's bouncing her characters. And I can just enjoy the book. And, and it's, that's something that gets harder and harder to find as you keep writing and you, you take more and more joy in it. So if you haven't read Lois Bujold, go read them. Excellent books. Absolutely. We had several people saying, yes, I love that series. Yes, I love that series. There's a few people who asked, could you repeat the name of that series that you were uh, just referring to? Uh, yeah, the Vorkosigan books. V-O-R-K-O-S-I-G-A-N. Yeah, Vorkosigan. Someone just, just went by. Oh. Uh, uh, they are, they're amazing books. You should read them. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, question here is there a secret meaning of this question is from michael by the way thank you michael is there a, a secret meaning with harry's catchphrases star and stones stars and stones yes yes the title of the last three books in the series are stars and stones hell's bells and empty night uh just so you guys know ah, okay well let, leave, leave it up to the readers then to uh make their own conclusions here yeah yeah <laughs> uh let's see question asking um we kind of touched on the tv series a little bit earlier but how disappointed were you in the drama series a not following the script and b not being renewed for further seasons oh i was crushed when when i found out that they weren't going to do a serial that they were going to do a series i was just crushed by that uh, that said, I actually got to go out to the set and, and, and be there for a week while they were filming an episode. And, you know, I'm actually in one of the episodes where I'm, I'm one of Butters' minions in the background. Oh, cool. And uh, uh, you can see me. I got the, the, the ponytail, so the hair is all back like this and everything. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I got to meet the people who worked on it. Uh, the cast members, the cast and crew. Uh, for the most part, had like read all the, had read the books and everything. They were very excited about it. Like all all the lighting and photography people and and everybody who you know, was you know in the army of folks doing stuff on the side. So it was like 150 people there every day working. Um, but uh, uh, all those folks were almost all of them were readers and were you know were coming up to me and talking and laughing and I had a great time with them. Uh, a bunch of the a bunch of the actors had, had had read the series as well, so that that was sort of nice. 
uh, uh, but I had a great time, you know, while I was there. And I think they, I think they did a good job and where I was in my career at that time, they, they did me all kinds of good. So you're never going to hear me say it was awful, you know, <laughs> that it was an awful experience. It wasn't, it did me, it did me a world of good. Um, I was a little disappointed that we couldn't have done it more in the, the, the right kind of storytelling style because the Dresden files just wasn't set up for episodes. You know, it, it's definitely a serial, but uh, the person that they had put in charge of it had just come off of Charmed and, and Charmed was very, he was very strongly episodic. And so he had very strong feelings about how we should do the Dresden Files. So. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe one day, who knows, maybe it'll get revisited one day. Did, what, well, I, 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 I'm hoping I, I can find somebody who will let me do, who, who will let me uh, do it and get uh, Straczynski as a showrunner, because that would be... <laughs> All right, let's see a question here from Brian. What tools do you use to plan out your books? Uh, I use a big piece of paper. Um, and then uh, my teacher taught us about story arcs and I took her a little literally. Uh, so what I do is I get a big piece of paper and then I, I just I start an arc and I draw it across like that. And over here is the beginning and over here is the end. Here's the big middle point. And then I just fill in all the like little tick marks and note what scene is going to have to be, is going to have to take place, you know, to get from logical point A to point B to point C so that we can get through the arc to the end. And then there's smaller arcs for each of the subplots and, and each of the sub characters each has their own little arc and so on. And so I've got to get that all figured out. And uh, that goes on several big pieces of paper. And then I stare at those uh until and what i tell myself is i'm staring at them until i can figure out the proper order to put everything into but what i really do is i stare at them until i get overwhelmed and frustrated and intimidated by how much there is to get done on the project and i just go start on the part that i want to do next and, and I go do that uh but uh but i tell myself i'm figuring things out you know yeah it seems like it's, that's got to be fun to just kind of jump into a scene but i, I can't even imagine the the logistical nightmare of making a novel, let alone a huge series like that, or multiple series at once. So, I'm very impressed. Well, that's not so hard. I mean, that's just that's just putting in hours. You know, I mean, if, if I was doing this all in a short story, that would be impressive. Uh, <laughs> doing it in twenty five books or so, that's you know, that's I imagine that's easier. It seems like it would be. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let's see. Question from Paul. Have you given any thought to publishing or displaying online the original outline for the Dresden Files and where, when the series ultimately concludes? No. No, why would I? Well, maybe maybe when it's all <laughs> over, I suppose. I'll, I'll, I'll do some, some, some crooked photocopies of my old, you know, my old uh, uh, college notebooks, you know, that I was doing this in, you know. Uh, uh, it's an old yellow notebook. Uh, it's in a, it's in a, it's in a box. I'm not sure where the box is. I think it's in storage somewhere, but, uh, uh, perhaps I could, perhaps I'll put that up, but I mean, it's just, it's a list of titles that are bad puns. You know, I mean, that, that was the, that was the foundation of the Dresden files was just a list of titles, you know, with, with the, the, that had just terrible double meanings. I mean, they were, it was just a bunch of dad jokes made into book titles. <laughs> uh, uh, that was really where the series came from, you know? Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Question from Ryan. So I, uh, you, your bio here mentioned that you are a gamer. Does your gaming experience include fantasy football? Uh, it does not do fantasy football. That was, <laughs> that was too, that was too much like jock stuff. I did football for a while and uh, 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 I, I actually, I did football for about three weeks of the actual season and wound up, uh, uh, wound up the junior varsity fullback. Uh, because I was really strong for my size, so I could take hits really well. So I could take hits from the varsity defense, and the JV fullback was through the varsity defense practice. To get. So I was quick and tough, so they, they thought I was great for that job. And uh, I wound up being unable to lift this arm. You know, my right arm and my left arm could only go this high. It was high enough to take a handoff. So anytime we were running on the right, I was ready to go. Uh, uh, and so I wound up, I wound up quitting football and going back to soccer, but boy, I was a monster when I got back to soccer. <laughs> you had to work a lot harder in football at that time. They didn't train as hard in soccer back then. <laughs> and, uh, just staying on the gaming for a second. Um, I'm curious now that gaming has really developed into a much more legitimate, uh, storytelling medium. Is that something you would like an avenue you would like to explore as uh, you know, helping create more games in the future? Uh, it'd be fun. 
it, I mean, it would be a lot of fun to work on something like that. And I, I certainly wouldn't have, wouldn't have any objection to that. Uh, I don't mind. Um, uh, I don't mind the concept of storytelling in games. Uh, I think it's very difficult uh, because, you know, there's this element of choice that the reader gets that, that the, that a protagonist doesn't, you know, a protagonist ultimately works for you and you know what he's going to do and you can set things up to, to make things happen. But readers are square or, or you know, gamers are squirrely. They're going to go their own way. Um, uh, it's because, I mean, it's players and players are the worst uh, uh, because it doesn't matter how well you plan your game. Players are going to figure out something else to do. Uh, uh, and, you know, you're going to be frantically building your world six inches in front of their toes. Uh, that's just how they work. And uh, uh, I, I think it'd be a lot of fun to do that for gaming. But um, I don't know. I might have a different approach than a lot of people seem to. Uh, <laughs> if only I think of stories differently. Yeah. Well, hey, if it comes out, we'd, we'd all love to play it. I'm, I've got my, my gaming system. Oh, well, it's the big business now, right? I mean, video games are the, are the big business. So, you know, I don't know. You're too high profile. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, what was your, this question is from Seth. Thank you for the question, Seth. What was your inspiration for the Cinder Spires? And when can we expect the next one? I think you said you're working on it currently, right? Right. Um. The inspiration for the Cinder Spires came while I was on the way home uh, from a LARP at, at sunrise. Uh, I was driving home. Uh, we'd left at about we'd left at about four a.m. while it was still dark, and it was on a su on Sunday morning. And uh, uh, it was it was basically we'd been up all night Saturday night gaming, and I decided rather than stay you know in a, a creaky old uh, cabin sleeping on some ply board and a and a, a a camp mattress that I would go home and sleep in my own bed. Uh, so I packed the boys up and we're driving home and they're all sound asleep because they're exhausted. And so I'm, I'm more exhausted than they are, but I'm driving. So I have to stay awake. So I, I, I pop in uh, nine inch nails uh, uh, and crank it up. And uh, as I'm driving home, I'm driving home and I'm racing a uh, uh, thunderstorm. And I'm driving north on I-35. I'm driving north on I-35 and I need to turn east and go this way. And this thunderstorm is coming in from this direction. So it's marching towards me as I'm driving up towards I-70. And it was, and watching it in, in, in the light of dawn was very, uh, it was very surreal uh, as the sun was coming up because the lighting was very strange. And there was a lot of lightning. So it was like this thing walking towards you on legs of lightning and getting closer and closer. And so, you know, the nine inch nails is going at, at, at maximum volume and I'm driving doing 95 down the highway to try and get ahead of the storm so that we don't have to you know, be going through it. And, uh, and while I was doing that, I could just see uh, airships fighting out on the horizon. And I went, ooh, that'd be a great setting for an airship fight, for airships fighting. And so in my head, I wrote the first couple of chapters of the first book you know, right there while I was driving home. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I, I drove us all home and I got the, got, got, you know, the kids back to their, to their houses and everybody tucked into bed and, uh, and I really wanted to sleep, but I, I stopped and wrote the first chapter instead. And then I went to sleep. So. Wow. When, when you get a good idea, you kind of got to work on it. You know, even if you haven't six hours, you know, so. Wow, so inspiration really can strike at any moment. And, that, and also, yep. good call on, on the Nine Inch Nails, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. And pardon, my, my cat is meowing at me, so hopefully he doesn't uh, disturb me anymore. But uh, bear with me with that. But uh, let's see. This is an interesting question from Ryan. Um, have you ever thought of doing a crossover with another author of any of your other, uh, for any of your other book series? Um. Correa wants me to write the Denarians attacking the compound at Cazador. Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody, if there's any Monster Hunter International fans out there, but uh, uh, but he thinks that would be an awesome story. Would be the Denarians versus Cazador as a as a, as a, crossover, as a crossover. Thank you, Michael Johnson. Yeah, that would be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. A uh, question from Denise. This for all the uh, writers out there. Um, how do you motivate yourself when you don't feel like writing? Um, I remind myself that if I don't, they will take my house away. <laughs> hey, um, simple enough. Here's the thing to understand. That gets easier and easier as you, as you do more writing um, because of this. Um, your experience writing the book versus reading the book versus a reader reading the book, those are three completely different experiences. So... 
even when you write and it feels like crap, what I find, you know, when I'm writing and it just feels clunky and it doesn't feel like it's working and nothing's flowing and none of the words are fitting together. And my vocabulary stinks and my plotting is off. And my characters are terrible and it's all just awful. And I'll be like, oh God, fine. Just get this chapter out of the way and we'll just get it done and we'll fix it in post. You know, we'll go to the next one. We'll fix this chapter later. Um, and then I find when I go back and I read and I go, oh, wait, one of these chapters was that that really crappy day. I remember I had a really crappy day in one of these chapters. You know, this was somewhere between 17 and 23. And, and I'll be reading chapters 17 to 23. And then I'll stop and I'll go back and I'll, I'll read them again. And then I'll go, I know one of these sucks terribly, but I can't tell which one because my subjective emotional experience of writing that chapter that day was not the same as my reading experience of the chapter. And it wouldn't be the same as the reading experience of the reader either, because the reader won't even know that I had a terrible day somewhere between 17 and 23. You know, they'll just be reading uh, and they, they won't notice my terrible day at all. And uh, if I go back later, I don't notice my terrible day either. So what that does after you've done that several hundred times is, is you realize my terrible days are mostly just me and mostly just my, my emotions in the moment. And they're not, they don't really have a whole lot to do with, with, uh, you know, my professional output here. Um, so once, once you've, once you've, once you've run into that several times, then it becomes a lot easier to go kind of make the donuts and you sit down and start working. <laughs> Makes sense. And, uh, just related to that, I'm curious, what does the editing process look like? I mean, are, are you, going back and doing a lot of drafts or have you kind of perfected a process at this point? I, I hear that writers do drafts. Um, generally the way I do it is I sit down and start writing chapter one and then I write them in sequence until I get to the end and then I type the end <laughs> and I go back through and make sure that uh, you know eyes are sea blue or sea green or whatever it is they're supposed to be. And, you know, small details like that are, are fixed. And uh, uh, if there's any polls that the beta readers uh, spotted, then I'll spackle over them and make sure that, they, that they're fixed before we, before we move along. Um, and then it goes off to my editor. My editor will, will have, you know, kind of high level things that will come back and I'll, I might have to fix this or that for the plot. Although these days I don't have to very much because they mostly just say, yeah, just let it leave them alone. It's similar. Um, uh, plus I've practiced a lot, you know, so they, they're, we're, we're comfortable with each other. Um, and then the copy editor comes back with, you know, uh, whatever the copy editor's concerns are. And, uh, I, 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 that's generally the end of my participation at, at that point, you know, um, they, they, they do have me do the fine read at the end, but I never find anything that the actual proofreader didn't find, you know, I mean, I just, I have a terrible brain for that sort of thing, but I try, um, uh, uh but Mostly they're just like, you're done with this now, right? Yeah, okay, I'm done. They're like, okay, good. Just let us, let us finish the book. Thank you, Jim. You know, like that. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, I, I had never liked doing multiple drafts of essays in school. So I, I can only imagine having to do multiple drafts of, of a novel. That sounds... Uh, yeah, I, I front load my writing process. So I, I can't really start writing a chapter until I can see the whole thing in my head. And once I can see the whole thing in my head, then I can sit down and just... And I'll, and I'll, I'll rip off 2,500 words in an hour, you know, uh, uh, it'll, and you know, when I'm working well, that's, that's kind of, that, that, that's kind of the speed it comes out at. And when I'm able to do that, then it comes out quick. Um, but getting those chapters lined up, uh, uh, becomes harder and harder, especially for the Dresden files, because there's more and more backstory to be consistent with. And I've never written a, a book, a, a story, 25 books long, you know, so I'm sort of feeling my way through this process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a cool question. If you were in the Dresden verse, would you want to be a magic user yourself and deal with the tech aversion or would you try to make it as a vanilla human being? Oh, I'd want to be a safely ignorant vanilla human being. <laughs> you know, one who believes that we are one of those people who believes there's nothing weird or strange out there and everything can be categorized can be you know categorized and, and, and cataloged and calculated and, and that seems like a much that seems like a much less terrifying universe if I was going to live there. Although if I had to live in a fictional universe, I think I'd pick Narnia just because <laughs> I a dog. Hey, there you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see, another, another uh, writing question from a, a writer in the audience, Nathaniel asking, I've read all of your books and your professor's books that you recommend, and I'm struggling with creating my character's family system. 
I know this may be a bit broad. Do you have any tips for fleshing out an engaging complex family system? Uh, I would say you could probably just use your own family as a model. It would be complicated. <laughs> um, uh, families are complex structures by their very nature. And, and they're the best thing to tell stories about because it's something that practically everybody is, you know, has some familiarity with. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I would do, or I would grab, uh, I would grab a historical family, uh, um, you know, say Caesar in his immediate circle, something like that, use that as a model. Um, honestly, I mean, just, just grabbing bits and pieces of history and, and throwing them down on a page and then, you know, throwing in those extra variables, you know, like magic that change things around, uh, uh those, those will almost always yield you something positive. Um, but if you can find if you could find a historical framework somewhere to use, um, that almost always helps. Oh, cool. Well, uh, let's see. This is a fun question here. What was the first thing you'd ever written with the intent for someone else to read? Well, it had to have been a school project at some point. Uh, I remember uh, my very first fiction that I really wrote full on fiction was in fourth grade. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it was this, it was a story that turned out, to, it was, it was a, this phantasmagorical horror story that turned out to all be a dream. Uh, so it was, it was like terribly cliched right from the get go. You know, I, I've been, I've been consistent that way. <laughs> and so, so you, you, you've always kind of known then from the get go that you wanted to write, you know, with an element of fantasy and magic. You, you don't ever have oh. any desire to write uh, something grounded. Oh reality sir i was a swords and horses fantasy guy for for a good six years you know of the eight or nine years it took me to to, to learn enough skill to break into the industry um and that's what i was going to write was swords and horses epic you know tolkien-esque fantasy that 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 was what was proper you know i only I, this whole dresden files thing is just a side project before i start my actual career ah okay <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, I'm, I'm skipping over some people, by the way, in these questions, just because I want to make sure I'm seeing some repeat names, and I, I don't think we're going to have enough time to get through all of these. Uh, yeah, they're, they're much faster than I can answer them, but we'll we'll, we'll do our best. Yes, and uh, and just again, big thank you to everyone joining us tonight. It's it's, it's so great to have all of you here. I, I wish we could see you in person. Um, so, question here from Bettina: um, What are the names of the types of stories you mentioned? Are they based on Hero's Quest or something else? I'm not sure what that's referring to exactly. So maybe. Oh, are, are you talking about the hero's journey here? Whoever asked this? Yeah, I think so. Oh, uh, what types of stories? Um, uh, the basic stories are the quest, which is really what everyone uses. Uh, rom romantic relationships, um, revenge, uh, survival. Uh, Let's see, uh, there's the greed-based story or, you know, kind of the heist, you know, for, 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 for whatever, but, but the story it's based on greed. Uh, and then there's self-discovery, which kind of sucks. And uh, uh, I think redemption is the other story. And the, the, the redemption stories I'm iffy on. I mean, I guess there was this guy named Jesus who had a, had a good one, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's, it's, hard, it's tough to write those, it really is. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, just kind of read this a bit before I ask you here. Uh, okay, you've said that 12 months was something that uh, had to happen rather than just jumping into the next Dresden adventure. Um, is this the first time you've had a surprise book? Um, and what's been the challenges in writing with an unplanned book? Uh, it's not the first time. It's uh, I, I've had to take books out of order before, and I knew I was going to do you know, kind of a, you know, kind of the, the Friends episode of Dresden, you know, where you sort of see his life through the year. Most of Dresden's books are uh, essentially the way I think of Dresden's stories are, I, I sit down and ask myself, what was Harry Dresden's worst weekend this year? Okay, that's what I'm going to write about. Uh, uh, and that's really what all the Dresden Files stories are. It's just Harry's worst, worst weekend. Um, and this story is going to be different because it's going to be stretched out over time. And it's not going to be quite as ferociously focused on, uh, uh, you know, there's doom coming unless we solve everything in the next two days, you know, uh, because it's longer than a weekend. Um, so, you know, Harry's going to have 
kind of longer term problems, sort of less immediate problems. Uh, uh, he's going to be running into problems that he's going to be finding as he becomes more of a leader, uh, as opposed to, to, to having, you know, more wizard trouble. You know, now he's now he's going to be having, you know, wizard trouble and, and you know, effectively Lord trouble as well. So <laughs> I was just chuckling over some of these comments here it says Dresden meets Jesus to take on the Denarians introduced by Gabriel, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Um, this was a question that I was going to ask you as well. How, how does one become a member of your uh, beta reading group? Um, normally, it's folks, you know, they'll, they'll make an observation or ask me a question that I think is particularly insightful. And I'll go, ooh, have you ever thought about being a beta reader? Um, uh, and there's, a, there, you know, I've got a bit of a waiting list. Um, but normally, you know, folks who have said, you know, even if, if you come up to me in a line uh, at an autographic or something and say, hey, I'd like to get on the beta reader waiting list, I'll be like, okay, give me your email address. And I've got uh, a drawer with lots of pieces of paper and receipts and con name tags that have email addresses on them, you know, that, that are more or less in order. Oh, cool. But I wish it was more organized than that. It just isn't. <laughs> Uh, let's see, a quiet question from Brian. Uh, will there ever be a recorded Polka Will Never Die album or set of songs available to listen to? Oh, I wish. In the meantime, I urge you to check out all the, all the, weird, the weird Owl Polka songs. <laughs> I, I listen to those when I'm writing Dresden Files, so. Oh, cool. Uh, let's see, uh, what's another good one here from Mark? Uh, with all of the reboots these days of old series, has there ever been and any interest of a Dresden Files reboot? I'm oh, yeah. About us. yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, we had, one, we had uh, a show in development with uh, ABC for a while. Uh, that fell through with some restructuring that happened there. Uh, I just got the rights back and we're gonna be having meetings with uh, studios in the future. We'll see if anything happens. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical of Hollywood's ability to produce something according to what the writer wrote. They seem to, have some issues in that direction, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, I, I think I might insist. You know what? If I'm doing this, I'm going to have a rolling kind of deal. You know, in terms of you know how the the actual product finished product gets done. Uh, you know, I, I want to. If I do get involved with something like that, I want to be working with the writers' room and and you know teaching the writers there the kind of story that I like to write and how to get it done. And, you know, hopefully that would be a whole bunch of fun and, and a good time would be had by all, but I just don't know if that's, uh, if that's in the cards, we'll see. <laughs> and I saw a few questions refer to this, so I'm just gonna give a big spoiler alert in case anyone has not read the series. Um, why did you kill Murphy? We had quite several people ask this. Well, not to put too fight a point on it, but there's one thing that mortals do really well. <laughs> Hey, that's, that's true, that's true. Yeah. Uh, let's see, question from Michael, and let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, is Harry a uh, Merlin bloodline? Is... Uh, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, no, he's, he's more important. Uh, uh, he's, in, he's in Merlin's, uh, he's in Merlin's uh, line, he's in Merlin's magical lineage. Um, the, the, those, those, uh, um, those, uh, uh, journals on, in Ebenezer's, in Ebenezer's room, uh, uh, the ones that go back, you know, to yawn olden days, those, those go back to Merlin's journals or rather, uh, Ebenezer's master's master's copies of those journals that he had to make because they were fading. Um, uh, but I mean, Harry's in the line of magic, of magical wizards that started with Merlin. He's from a prestigious, uh, meritocracy, uh, or as opposed to a genetic, uh, genetic line. Ah, okay, and let's see, we have another question kind of getting back to TV and all of that. Someone asking, a year or two ago, I thought you gave a soft announcement of a new TV or streaming series. Is that still happening? Uh, well, I mean, that was, it was, no, that's not. That was, that was in the, that was in the works. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, uh, which is just as well. They told us we couldn't use vampires or fairies or werewolves for a season, which really made things limited. <laughs> so... Okay, uh, let's see. Question from Denise. I'm going to try to get through these quickly because we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, so asking from Denise, uh, I know this is a question all authors hate, but where are you on the current writing of 12 months? 
Uh, the, I'm on the first chapter of 12 months. Uh, I'm on chapter 24 of the, of the next, uh, uh, of the next Cinder Spires and chapter 20 something of, uh, of that science fiction series that I, I, I do swear I'm going to write one of these days. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's kind of what uh, I've been working on right now. I'm working on a short story that is the, um, mouse and Kerberos team up story. Uh, so. Uh, you guys can look forward to that one. That's going to be in the anthology called The Dog Saves the Day. And that's the one where all the profits are going towards animal shelters, uh, various animal uh, charities that the different writers have. So, Okay, cool. I see a question. Yeah, the mouth will be good. Yeah, the spirit of the Nemean lion has escaped from hell and has to be recovered, but he's got help. So Kerber now Kerberos needs help. So he goes to hire mouse. He's the client. So, Awesome. Uh, I see a question here from my old coworker Heather. We used to work at a, a used bookstore together before I was a librarian, and she and uh, several of my other coworkers were always recommending your books to people. So I want to make sure I get her question in here. Um, is uh, is Cat Sith gone forever, and can Nemesis be cured? Uh, I don't think so. And cured is a really strong word. Um, <laughs> Nemesis can be treated, uh, uh, and and it actually Nemesis actually has been treated on screen in the book, and I'll, I'll let you guys wonder about that one. Uh, but I did it on purpose and showed everybody somewhere in the middle of the series. So, <laughs> and let me see. Just before let me do one final. Well, I'll ask this question here. Uh, this is a funny one. Has has Burger King or any donut shops reached out to you for product product placement? It really seems like they should have by now, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, my, I should be wearing coats that have like Dunkin' Donuts patches on the sleeves and stuff like that. <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, Coca-Cola, I think. I think Coca-Cola on this arm, uh, that would work out well. I mean, if Dale Earnhardt can do it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and so let's see. I also, I just want to remind everyone, I put the links again in the chat to the survey and the events calendar. If you could all, before you leave today, if you could take a moment to click that survey link, it's just two questions. Very helpful for the library. So we appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Let me try to get one or two more questions in here, or maybe just one more. Let's see. Um, ooh, okay. This is one I was going to ask. Okay. Do you enjoy doing the audiobook recording for the latest short story? Or did you enjoy doing the audiobook recording? Oh, that was a ton of fun. Uh, they wouldn't let me do a British accent, though, for Mab. So I had to wind up doing Mab's voice as kind of this raspy whisper. Because apparently the audio director had friends in England and she would have she would have been teased horribly if I had done, you know, my standard American Renaissance Festival accent. <laughs> uh, but but I'm not quite actor enough to pull off just a perfect British accent like Robert Downey or somebody. So uh, but it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, uh, and I would enjoy doing, I would enjoy doing some more. I might in the future, uh, uh, maybe with some of the other properties. Uh, uh, I think the Dresden Files fans love James reading, uh, uh, and, and as do I. So, I mean, that's fine with me. Cool. All right. Well, unfortunately we are running out of time here, so I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. We're really so grateful that you could, uh, take this time out of your schedule to zoom in from us out of state and, um, give all your fans this, this kind of one-on-one -on -one thing here. I wish we we're able to see everyone uh, in attendance, but I really am so grateful all of you that you could join us here tonight. Um, anything else you want to leave the audience with or any other projects you wanted to mention before we uh, head out here? No, uh, I thank you so much for your time and attention tonight, guys. Uh, I, I'm, I'm starting, I'm getting into gear and working again. It's going slowly, but it's going. Thank you so much. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And thank you everyone in the audience. Have a wonderful evening. Good night, guys. Alrighty.